Welcome to life on earth. Welcome to life on earth. Welcome to life on earth. Always coffee. Why always coffee? Because I can. Welcome to life on earth. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining the Vice Squad. That's right. This is episode 92 of Life on Earth. Those of you who have been with me since the beginning, those of you who have come on board lately, thank you for making this happen. I'm getting close enough to 100. It's time to start making special plans, and I've got a few things in mind. But first, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the Vice Squad. I'd like to talk to you about vice. I'm going to lead off with a quote from Leonard Peikoff about the primacy of virtue over vice. Now, I am aware of the irony. I didn't miss this. Believe me, the irony in criticizing hypercriticism. <laughs> but my point is not that it's wrong to judge, to be aware, to know what's wrong in the world, merely that judging virtue is as important philosophically and more important psychologically, spiritually, sense of life terms, than judging vice. So, so let me quote Leonard Peikoff. The first duty of justice is to acknowledge and defend the good. In fact, let me read the whole passage. It was just an excerpt from Dr. Peikoff's lecture on the moral foundations of government. This is Leonard Peikoff speaking, quote, I want to underscore that a very crucial aspect of justice pertains to the issue of justice to the good, the virtuous. Conventionally, people often think that justice consists only of punishing or condemning the evil while remaining neutral or indifferent toward people who are good. Now, this view stems from the idea that evil is metaphysically potent and fear-inspiring, whereas the good is impractical and yawn-invoking. On the objectivist view, however, it is, if anything, more important to praise and reward the good than to condemn the evil, to speak up and fight for the men who are right and who represent rational values. Granted, the evil must be fought and condemned, but then brushed aside what counts in life. And this is the issue, of course, of the potency of virtue. What counts in life is the good. They are the men who create the values life requires. They are the men mankind relies on. They are the men whose virtues and achievements must be acknowledged above all if justice is a virtue and if life is the standard. So it is important to tell Plato, for instance, that he's wrong. But it is more important that Aristotle hears somebody who recognizes that he is right. It is important that James Taggart not get away with the fraud that he runs Taggart Transcontinental. But it is more important that Reardon find someone who can understand what he is achieving. The first duty of justice is to acknowledge and defend the good. Close quote, Leonard Peikoff, Objectivism and the Foundations of Moral Government. That's a lecture eight from his original lecture series on objectivism. Now, consider vice squads. If you know anything at all about police or police shows, police procedurals, you know what a vice squad is. You know, real vice squads like the police have, these are groups that fight drugs and prostitution. And if you go back in time enough, things like uh, pornography or even abortion, maybe that's coming again. But among other things, vice squads fight victimless crimes, uh, crimes which do sometimes lead to real crimes, real victims, but victimless crimes, which shouldn't even be crimes. And similarly, we, we in the philosophical community, in the objectivist community, we are fighting real evils. But we imagine ourselves surrounded by vice. 
but most of the people that we imagine are bad, vicious, evil, they aren't. Most people are not crazy left-wingers or crazy right-wingers, much less the most you know, power-lusting people, politicians. They're tradesmen and musicians and office workers and restaurant workers and flight attendants and baristas. You know, we smile or some of us grimace when Jean-Paul Sartre writes, hell is other people. But we, as objectivists, as fans of Ayn Rand, we are not malevolentists, to coin a phrase. And Sartre's quip, or the way most of us interpret it, was wrong. People aren't rotten, and living with them isn't hell. We do not accept the malevolent universe premise. We are here to live a life and not to just not die. And further, we can live a life because Sartre and Gail Winan and Ellsworth Tui and Dr. Robert Stadler were wrong. And not just in fiction, Jordan Peterson's idea of life as suffering and occasional breaks from suffering, he is wrong. Suffering is the exception. Vice is the exception. There was a recent Twitter post, and whoever put up this tweet asked commenters to name the most heartbreaking song. Incidentally, for this one, I went with Dido's White Flag. Listen to it if you don't know the song. But thinking about it, there is no end to sad, painful, heart-wrenching tunes because, you know, even in the best of lives, we are mortal. And so for every value, there's also the potential for loss. Life is finite. Man is mortal. And therefore, there is a necessity in confronting pain and fear and guilt and putting them in their place. And maybe some of us choose to join the vice squad as a distraction from the actual hardships, the actual challenges, the bittersweet in life. I get that. But you know, when it comes to vice, we never had to take any of it seriously, did we? We confront vice, we guard ourselves against it, we ensure against it, we fight it. But it only goes down to a certain point. Speaking of Howard Roark, there's a model. He will build the Stoddard Temple or Monadnock Valley. And when Stephen Mallory warns him, this doesn't seem right, this may all come to a bad end. What does Howard Roark say? He says, well, would you have missed this? The experience of creating this, of building this, of making it all happen, of going through this, even if they take it all away from you afterward. You know, if you haven't seen the film Chocolate in a while, or Galt forbid, if you haven't seen it at all, I heartily recommend watching it, especially the speech at the end of the film. So, spoiler alert, next 30 seconds here, if you haven't seen Chocolate. Chocolate, chocolate, tune out for a bit. When Père Henri delivers his sermon, he's a young priest and it's halting and awkward and, and yet it's crucial. He says, listen, here's what I think. I think we can't go around measuring our goodness by what we don't do, by what we deny ourselves, by what we resist and who we exclude. I think we've got to measure goodness by what we embrace, by what we create, and who we include. And this isn't about moral equivalence. This is about fully understanding and living the truth that values are primary, and you don't build a building by refraining from knocking one down. You know, consider that, the face without pain or fear or guilt. 
you know, Howard Rourke laughed. Hank Reardon laughed. Francisco D'Anconia laughed. Consider how Rostand presents Cyrano's laughter, so beautifully portrayed in the film by Jose Ferrar. They laugh not because they don't fight evil, but because their primary concern is reality, the real world, conquering nature, not men. And yes, living on earth with other people, people who create, people who produce, people who are reality focused, people who exchange value for value, people who are values. You know, consider Reardon at the end of Atlas. Fully self-confident, self-possessed, all of his inner conflicts resolved. You know, this is the Reardon that Dagny always saw. Because Dagny always saw Hank Reardon as the man who belonged on Earth. You know, when Eddie says to the anonymous worker in the cafeteria, do you know what's strange about your face? You look as if you've never known pain or fear or guilt. Well, it carries the opposite intention, but the exact same irony as when James Taggart complains to his sister, oh, you've never suffered. You're on WhatsApp right now. If you're a member of the Ayn Rand Center UK, you're probably on WhatsApp. It's where we exchange inside information. In fact, if you're not a member of the Ayn Rand Center UK, this is a good time to remind you. AynRandCenter.co.uk, go to the website. Click become a member or follow the link that's already in the chat. You should be a member of the ARC UK. Make shows like this and better shows like the TDO that happened earlier today that I'll talk about in a moment happen. Thank you for supporting us. And if you put in a super chat during the chat today, that too goes to support the ARC UK. Makes you one of those value for value people. That would be super awesome. And on WhatsApp, there's a conversation going on in the ARC UK random chat regarding empty compliments. Well, this was great for me because I had to comment right away. Our compliments should be reality-based, but that much established, we should be more quick to compliment than we are to criticize, to recognizing virtue than we are to tracking down vice. Because our achievements are vastly more important than our failings. I then posted to a link. There was an episode of Five Minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer, that Sunday show you all know and love, in which Apollo Zeus was good enough to watch it. And he commented, and he's in the chat right now, and he commented with a quote from Amy Nacer, quote, by pointing out why you like a person or what they said or did that you liked. You bolster your own values and you recognize the good around you. And all of that protects you from sinking into cynicism or depression or assuming the worst of others. Close quote, Amy Nacer, I like her. Again, the point isn't always be nice, but when you do judge negatives, when you denounce, when you fight, do so with a purpose and with specific goals in mind so you are effective and so that you know when you're done. You know, we look at the Karens and the Fionas, you know, that, that outraged and triggered gal with the glasses in the meme, you know, the how dare yous and the did you just assume my gender memes? <laughs> and we look at all that as if, as if criticism puts us above the fray. The criticism puts us above the fray. The real winning strategy was suggested by Whopper. Some of you will know what that is. W-O-P-R, the supercomputer in the film War Games. You know, we're talking artificial intelligence. Go watch that old, old 1983 film War Games. Unless there's something in it for you. Unless there's something in it for you, we're talking the virtue of selfishness. Then as Whopper would say, the only winning strategy is not to play. Now, happily, since we don't believe in duty, we don't feel any duty to fight 
wars which are not ours. Now, there are certain rites of passage. I can talk about this because I'm older now. There are certain rites of passage, things we learn, things we go through that prepare us for a mature and successful life. Education is full of these rites of passages, you know, learning how to talk to people, deal with people, look someone squarely in the eye, give a firm handshake, you know, deal with them fairly, play well with others. Learning how your own mind works. You know, learning not just epistemology, but even failure modes, cognitive biases. This is crucial to becoming confident and competent. Rites of passage, puberty, <laughs> graduation, leaving home, marriage, parenthood. And among these rites of passage, these sometimes rude awakenings, is learning that bad things happen. You know, the first time you're bullied or your first unrequited love, the first paycheck you receive when you see how much the government skims off the top, that first time when you start paying attention to the news and politics, and you discover that all sorts of people, intellectuals and politicians and activists of all stripes, are doing all sorts of things that are, in fact, making your life harder, personally, professionally, financially, in general. And here's the thing. For each one of those rites of passage, each of these value-laden realizations, this heavy stuff, we can learn what we need to learn and go forward, move ahead with greater wisdom. Or we can become obsessed. Now, if someone becomes obsessed in a good way, say someone goes through a lot psych psychologically and they develop a passion for psychology and they study the field and they choose to become a clinical psychologist, great. But you know, we laugh at Count Rugen when he states to Inigo Montoya, you've got an overdeveloped sense of vengeance. It's going to get you into trouble someday. <laughs> Inigo was a member of the Brute Squad. He was not a member of the Vice Squad. You know, he isn't just angry or complaining about Vice. He's doing something about it. Now, on the other hand, we can, or at least I know I can, and I see this everywhere. We can find ourselves obsessed in a way that doesn't lead to any effective action, doesn't increase our effective wisdom, doesn't accomplish anything, doesn't let us move on from that rite of passage. There, there, there is no passage. I've seen people do this with philosophy. Uh, you can decide yourself whether I'm a victim of this, and you, know, you too, if the shoe fits, at least a little. For example, we learn objectivism, but we don't really apply it. Not really. We, we never move on from that learning phase to the application phase. You know, like a lifelong student who stays in college and never uses anything that he's learned. I was always a little suspicious back in grade school of my fellow students who complained, but I'll never use this. Or, you know, there's memes about it that complain about our schools teach us to, you know, they teach us calculus, but they don't teach us how to balance a checkbook or do taxes. Now, yes, I've always been suspicious of that it, if you can do calculus, but you can't manage a budget, you can't fill out a tax form, there is something wrong and it's not a problem with your schooling. <laughs> but yes, we do learn a bunch of foolish things in grade school. So, okay, we learn philosophy which opens our eyes and fills us with righteous anger. And if that's the main thing we get, or the main thing that we use, it's useless knowledge. Well, I mean, it's useful for one thing, eternal outrage, developing a boulder-sized chip on our shoulder. We become experts at identifying vice. We join the vice squad. 
in a world of miracles, metaphorical miracles, but virtual impossibilities, inconceivable. Nonetheless, in this world of dazzling abundance and opportunity, we cannot celebrate achievement, innovation, progress, wonders, because we can't see it. All we see is vice. All we see are the destroyers. We imagine we're living in the final chapters of Atlas Shrugged. You know, we imagine that those who learn objectivism, you know, the, those weirdos, those people who learn objectivism and then go on to live joyous, successful, prosperous, happy lives, uh, those are the naive Dagny Taggarts and Hank Reardons. While, you know, there's a world full of mouches, mooches out there and Ferrises, and they're the ones really running the show. And all of we red pill objectivists, <laughs> all we can do is join the vice squad. And hey, that's certainly our right. We can do that. We have that right. We don't have to join the countless successful objectivist businessmen and women working hard and building magnificent lives. We don't have to enjoy and share and celebrate the endless achievements of science and technology and music and sports and everything around us. We don't have to admire the countless achievers, objectivist and non-objectivist alike, the entrepreneurs and the CEOs and the chefs and the baristas and the composers and the musicians and the choreographers and the dancers and the coaches and the athletes and the land developers and the architects the countless achievers who right here, right now, make this world so magnificent. Now we can stay on the vice squad and see nothing but the headline news and grouse self-righteously about Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Marjorie Taylor Greene or George Santos this week or whoever makes the headlines today. Learning there is evil is a rite of passage. We, we learn we've got to devote some small but non-trivial amount of time and attention and resources to protecting ourselves from bad people and bad things. How much time? How much attention? How much resources? I loved earlier today, there was an episode of TDO, The Daily Objective, and it's Thursday, so it was the weekly collective episode. And if you know the TDOs that they do on Thursday, it will be multiple guests or multiple hosts and often multiple topics. So they'll announce a topic, but they're really each person on there brings up a topic. And the topic for the day, the topic for the day was Tucker Carlson, who is now going to do a show, since Fox booted him out, do a show on Twitter. Twitter of all places. That sounds, but then you remember, oh yeah, Elon Musk is running Twitter now, and he's kind of a conservative slash libertarian slash clown show kind of guy. So yeah, Tucker Carlson on Twitter. And that was their first topic. And they talked about that for a while. And then when that topic ran its course, uh, this next topic they brought up was thought experiment. If you could go back to the past and change one thing about your life, what would it be? Uh, and Jax, who Apollo Zeus rightly recognizes in the chat, I thought gave a great answer. It was the first answer, and it was a very short answer. And it was, I wouldn't want to go back and change anything. You know, that kind of stuff will wreck you. It's not just that there's no value in it because it's metaphysically impossible. Yes, there are great philosophical objections to it, but even just pragmatically or psychologically, it, I've always said, me personally, now not Jax, my answer has always been, well, I wouldn't want to change anything before 1988, because if I did, my daughter might not be born. I don't want to change a thing. I don't want to take the smallest chance of screwing that up. I think, well, but I wouldn't want to change anything before 2000 when I got married. That, that, that absolutely must not change. 
point is, yeah, you don't actually want to do that. But then Paul Gay gave his answer, a Hollywood writer. Actually, Jax is a Hollywood writer, too. And he gave a great and very long answer. And you'll have to watch TDO for today to get the full answer if you didn't already. But he explained in some detail how, yes, every change you would make, you've actually got to think about all of the impact of that. And all of this was a worthwhile and valuable thought experiment. And it's, at times it got really touching, heartfelt, bittersweet, and charming. <laughs> and as they spent 10, 20 minutes on this, I thought, man, they should have led with that. I mean, Tucker Carlson, I get it. That, that brings in the clicks, and we're all curious, okay, what's Tucker doing now? But the discussion that Paul gave, and Nikos, and Jax on this topic, this thought experiment, which on the face of it is, what, whimsical and not even consistent with objectivist metaphysics, right? Brilliant. Beautiful. And of value, Tucker is not of value to anybody. I don't know. Maybe if you like his shtick, he's of some value to you. But the things they discussed after that, that's the good stuff. So how much time and attention and resources should we give to what needs to be fought? Should we give to vice? Should we give to evil? You know, that's a matter of temperament. My point is, my point is, we've got to decide that. And we should do it consciously, intentionally. Say we want to spend 3% of our time on the fight. And 97% of our time living our lives. Great. Or Say we have, say you have a passion for justice and an interest in fighting and doing it well. So, you know, you decide to become an attorney or a cop or a soldier or a professional intellectual, and you're going to put 70% of your time into fighting for the good. Great. If you're going to do it seriously. Or do we want to let our anger consume us? without really doing anything about it, other than complaining on the internet, which sometimes feels like doing something. Do we want to join the vice squad? Not so great. Now, Sam is in the chat. Sam, oh yes, and that is super cool with because he's got a super chat here and says, can one be morally perfect while still be, be while still practicing vices? Example, smoking while you know it's unhealthy for you. That's a tough one. I mean, the answer is easy. The answer is, actually, even in the answer is not that easy because the question would be, can you be morally perfect while still practicing vices if you know they are vices? And if you have a compelling reason, to do the things you're doing, are they really vices? Good question. That one could give you a whole episode. Uh, you know, I went to Japan recently and I'm surprised to see that people still smoke there. I'm amazed that people still smoke in the United States and Canada. And I know objectivists who are cigarette smokers. It's the strangest thing. And you ask them and they say, well, you know, you're a coffee drinker. That's kind of one of my trademark moves on my show. Now, I don't think coffee is as bad for you as smoking. Arguably, coffee isn't bad at all unless it's keeping you from getting enough sleep at night. I have been known to fall for that now and then. But smokers will tell me there is a value in smoking. Just like certain kinds of hot cuisine, very fine foods, aren't super healthy. You'd be better off if you ate a diet of strict you know, here are 10 foods you should eat and here are 10 foods you shouldn't eat. And whether you are a vegetarian or a vegetarian, whatever you have decided works best for your metabolism, incidentally, that is my belief is that there ain't one thing that works for everybody. And that's proven just by experience. But whatever it is, if you figured out that's the right thing to do and you don't do it consistently, are you not morally perfect? Or is the value of food, the enjoyment of food across many domains, more important than perhaps squeezing another year out of your life. And the same thing for all sorts of quote unquote vices. Is cigarette smoking really a vice? Yes, it's unhealthy. Yes, it increases certain risks in your life. 
hard for me to justify it, but anyway, great question. Thank you for that. I will think about it. I might end up doing a whole episode on that, on the calculus of values, because yes, we could live as monks or hermits and probably live longer. There are all sorts of things we could do that could squeeze more years out of our live, lives, but would also squeeze all of the life out of our years, to steal a phrase. So let me, let me give some thought to that one. But thank you for the super chat. And anybody else super chats, you know your super chats do support the Ayn Rand Center UK. So very much appreciated. Let me tell you, there's a friend of mine who's an atheist and an Ayn Rand fan. And this guy is, is substantially older than me, if, if you can imagine that. And he has reached a peculiar conclusion about Christians. Most Christians, this atheist has found, are by and large more reasonable, more successful, or at least better company than most secularists. And in a similar vein, I have other non-political, non-philosophical friends and family who have reached a similar conclusion about politics and philosophy. That people who don't spend a lot of time on politics and in their mind don't spend a lot of time on philosophy are actually happier. They get on with living their lives. Now, whether they get it consciously and explicitly or not, they do understand something that a lot of us don't. And this I find unacceptable. This is my outrage factory. I've said it before, and I will say it again. If Ayn Rand's philosophy is true, and it is, if objectivism really is the first fully accurate, true, consistent operator's manual for human life, then it stands to reason that objectivists, other things being equal, should be among the most rational and the most successful and the most benevolent, happiest people on earth. Ideas make better tools than weapons. If you use them as tools and not just as weapons. And of course, tools, weapons, it's a false alternative. Ideas, correct ideas, make great tools and great weapons, but the tools aspect is primary. Well, the weapons part is derivative. You know, because before you can fight for anything, you've got to have something, even if it's just a potential, something to protect. Values. Values are primary. You know, if the alternative is well, forget about living a life. Spend your time fighting ideas versus forget about ideas and spend your time living a life. If I had to pick between those two, I would recommend the latter. Get out there and live a life. Now, happily, we needn't make either mistake. We need to be able to see vices and, you know, not just capital E evil, but, you know, simple, bad ideas, bad practices, bad actions. We need to see them for what they are, both to avoid the ill effects of the bad behavior of others, friends, family, politicians, whoever, and, and to know if we're at risk of falling short ourselves, you know, to keep ourselves virtuous. But we can be vigilant. We can judge vice without becoming a vice squad. We can judge vice and far more importantly, praise virtue. And more importantly than that, we can practice virtue. We can decide on our own individual purposes, practice the good to achieve our ends, practice rationality, honesty, integrity, Productiveness, independence, justice, pride. And as a magnificent secondary consequence, show others what these ideas look like in the real world. To hell with vice. Study virtue. Practice virtue. Apply virtue. 
live the best life you can. So welcome to Life on Earth. Let's do this.